Dude, I appreciate you doing this. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Did you ever think like 40 years ago when we were sitting in band class, <laughs> fast forward, you'd be sitting with microphones across the table from me somewhere? <laughs> hey, I, I never, nothing's ever out of the question. So no, nothing's ever out of the question. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I appreciate you giving me some time tonight, too. Um, before we get into it, I want to talk a little bit about RC21X. Sure. If we can. Um why don't you just give me some background on what the firm is exactly? We're going to get into your background and sure, how you sure. got to that point, but I want to talk about the matter at hand right now is the firm. Yeah, so uh, RC21X was started by one of our other classmates, uh, Clarence Carlos, and he and I ran into each other. I hadn't seen him since, I would have to probably say, right around when he graduated from high school in wow. 80, 82. Okay. And so from 82 to probably 2000, I don't know if it was not 8, 9, 10, Somewhere in there, I ran into him at Ichiban up in Robinson. I uh, having dinner one night, and he started telling me about you know what he had uh, gone through, um, the passing of, uh, of of a good friend of his son, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 how that misdiagnosed head injury you know may could have been possibly prevented or or or, uh, or fixed you know relatively easily, and it wasn't. So I think that kind of really put him on a journey uh, to develop. Uh, what we call a personal performance companion. Okay. And so the idea of of what we've developed started with that concept of let people at any time quickly measure and assess their performance to see if they're within their normal ranges. And if they're not, then you might investigate as to why you're not within your normal ranges. It could be you were distracted when you were when you were doing you know doing the session. It could be that there's something actually wrong with you, okay. which then might prompt a visit to your doctor. Uh, it, it could be something like you, you're tired. You need to take a nap, right? So there's a lot of different reasons and things uh, as to why you would want to measure performance. But what the, co- the, the company has kind of transformed into is this tool that is being used uh, both in the uh, medical side, so for rehabilitation, of, of, of people that have had things like strokes, concussions, traumatic brain injuries. Mm-hmm. So they're coming in already impaired. They've had that event. Okay. And, and they're going to go through rehabilitation. So the question is, is how do you know you're getting better with rehabilitation? You can't maybe, measure it. Maybe you can, well, you it, 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 pr- prior to our tool, there are a lot of subjective observations from a clinician or from mm-hmm. a therapist saying, oh, you know, you, you only did six reps yesterday and today you did 12 so you're getting better right but there was no objective measurement that um could quickly and easily be done and, and especially now on a on a cell phone right okay. so that's really you know initially our first tool we developed was um about a 15 minute uh assessment 12 different modules and what we've done is taken a number of neuropsych psychological uh, pencil and paper tests. These are tests that have been around for 50, 60 years, clinically validated tests. If you went in to see a neuro- neuropsychologist, these are the t- types of tests they would give you in their office. Okay. What we did is turn those into like 10 to 45 second video like game experiences so that you don't feel like you're taking a test. You feel like you're playing a game. Sure. Right? But at the same time, we're capturing a lot of data, a lot more data than you could capture if it's just me as, a, let's say, a neuropsychologist measuring you so one one of the one of the uh, uh tests is a uh, very well established it's a finger tapping test right okay. so if you go into the doctor's office they're just going to they start the stopwatch they stop it at 10 seconds um they're going to count how many times you tap your finger on the table that's really all right and that kind of tells them what's going on with your some of your brain function in addition to that measurement our app also is ca- you know calculating how long is your finger down how long is it up do you have a is your rhythm increasing is it slowing down okay so there's a lot more data points that we can capture um that you previously couldn't so we're doing that across all these different uh uh, measurements and like i said we create this baseline for you and then anytime you want um like like for example for the person going through rehabilitation each time they come in for therapy they get a measurement you know, we're getting better or not right got it uh covid is another thing that really i think changed the way People think about their own personal well-being, mental health. Mm-hmm. You, you know what's happened with mental health mm-hmm. over the last couple of years. So these are all things that are making us more aware in a sense of I should probably keep track of what's happening 
from me, you know, not necessarily day to day, but month to month and definitely year to year. Right. So that's really kind of what the original idea was. Right. Um, that's now kind of uh, metamorphosized itself into something not different, but in addition to measurement and assessment, mm -hmm. we're now working with some companies um, and integrating some of their processes around uh, things like um, treating people that have soft tissue injury. Okay. So what happens if you don't get a soft tissue injury on the job taken care of quickly? You end up um, you know, either going on to disability mm -hmm. Or you go on to file a workers' comp claim, right? So the idea is if we can keep those people healthy, it saves the company money. It also doesn't require that position to be then, you know, somebody rehired or trained right. for that particular job. So, right. and then the person staying healthier, which obviously is a benefit to the individual right. as to why they would want to do that. So in a sense, that's what the tool is. It's, it's basically a series of, of uh, modules that allow you within, you know, the, the Roberto app, which is our mm -hmm. mobile app, mm -hmm. uh, it takes about six minutes and you can um, check your performance, you know, any time of the day, night at home, at work. Or so it's self-administered then. It is. And that's another big differentiator between us and a lot of the tools in the marketplace. A lot of those require a clinician to Got administer it. the session. We don't do that. We, we, you know, it can be used in that in, in NovaCare, one of our customers uses it that way. They actually administer the sessions, but the power of our tool is, is it doesn't need to be clinically administered. Okay. Um, you and I sat down on my radio show. At, I think, I believe it was a fall of 18, man, time flies. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, it has this uh, ancillary business, this portion of your business that has grown. Right. Is that, is that since then? Because that seems new it's, to me. Yeah, this, it's actually, you know, going on right. We're developing some of those okay. new pieces, right? Literally this week is when we started that. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I remember in our prior discussions too, a lot, a lot of the work you did also came out of the, um, uh, the idea of sports concussions, right? right, right. And evaluating that is, right. and is that is that correct? Yeah. So, um, you know, go, again, going back to the 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 young man that passed away, he was a football player. He wasn't playing football, but um, you know, he he basically that's kind of where this all started. Was you know, he was a football player. Clarence played football. Right. Concussions obviously is a is a huge issue with with football. Mm -hmm. Although they say that, that it's not, um, I don't know how that works. Yeah, well, <laughs> follow the money, brother. But uh, but no, I think that uh, that's where we originally started, and what we soon realized after engaging with the University of Texas at Arlington's Human Performance Institute and Dr. George Kondrasky, who kind of helped us develop all of our algorithms, we learned of his work, okay. and he looks at the human body as a system, just like you would look at any system in business or any system in, in, you know, that's, that's, that's functioning with different parts. Okay. And he looks at the human body that way. So we then realized that, you know, what we're doing doesn't just apply to people that might have a concussion. It's really anybody. And I think what accelerated that was, you know, going back again with to COVID and, you know, you have people that are not necessarily, getting COVID and having issues, which is one, you know, long haulers is a real thing. People, uh, you know, don't sometimes don't get their taste or smell right. back. Oh yeah. Sometimes they have joint issues. Sometimes they have uh, brain fog. You know, mm -hmm. my wife had brain fog for about five weeks after her first uh, COVID episode. And so I think that that really opened up a lot because that touched a, I mean, touched a lot of us here around, the, around the world. So certainly I think those events, you know, really allowed us to kind of focus on what are we trying to do and it's more than just um i think we're, we're trying to do more than just measure and assess we're trying to help people uh be the best they can be mm -hmm. and part of it is measuring and assessing where you are but there are also things you can do you know to improve your sleep for example or right. to reduce your stress or to you know eat better you, you kind of mm -hmm. know a little bit about that you know so th all mm -hmm. those things it would be interesting to see what your performance was before you changed your diet to today, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I would. Yes, it would have been interesting, and I uh, kind of, kind of upset we didn't do that ahead of time. That would have been interesting. I know what I feel, and I know what right, I can right. cognitively do now compared to right, right. You know, at the start of COVID, um, the pandemic in general. But yeah, 
I would be interested to see those numbers too. So if I, you're saying if I would have had a baseline right. before right. then, right. I would just be able to continue with the testing yep. and see the improvement. Yeah, I mean, basically you play. So you know, we you you have to complete two sessions to set up your initial baseline, just like a golf handicap. But each time you play. You know, if you have a really good round, right, your oh, handicap yeah. goes down, right? That wouldn't be me. All right. Well, so so that that's the concept is as we go through life, there are things that we are in control of and there yeah. are things that we're not in control of and all of them affect our performance. Right. 100%. Right. So relationships can affect your performance. Mm-hmm. Your work life can affect your performance. Finances. I mean, there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with the news. The bo- exactly. Right. Or, or social media. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um I think that's really kind of where we started and kind of where we are now is it's, you know, we did a, we did a, um, a really good program up at Parkway and uh, the career and technology center in Oakdale. Right. And the superintendent there really wanted to, you know, give these kids a tool that really helped prepare them for the next chapter of their life. Most of them are not going to college. Mm -hmm. Most of them are either going in three quarters of them, I think are going into the trades and the other quarter might be going into the military. And so, when you go into work, um, what we were able to do with those seniors and you know even kids in ninth and tenth and eleventh grade is stress the importance of how sleep and stress can impact your performance on the job. No right? doubt. And if you look at uh, accidents and injuries on the job, seventy-five percent of them, approximately, are due to mental mistakes. So either you've been distracted while you're trying to perform a task or you're fatigued or you're thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that can impact performance. But if you're able to fine tune kind of what you do to yourself, some of the inputs, right, then hopefully the output is better, better performance. Right. So that's really kind of what the um, uh, this program was, was we started with their sports medicine and rehabilitation therapy students. And then they ended up training the rest of the students in the school through all the different disciplines, cybersecurity, cosmetology, welding, whatever. They're all playing Roberto every, not every day, they're playing it twice a week. But in addition, we were helping them, they identify which area they wanted to work on. Do I want to get better sleep this semester or or, or reduce um, you know, my stress, whatever the case may be. And then we would push them tips and articles and videos a couple of times a week to really help them kind of change their behavior does essentially. The, does, so the app does it um does it, does it point the user in in the direction of of areas of sleep improvement areas of uh right it, it does that the app does that okay for this particular situation yes yeah. okay yes. yes okay yeah, one thing that really boggled my mind was when i read some statistics mark that like the amount of concussions in sports that you would not necessarily associate with concussions, right? You know, like soccer. I know the ball hits your head. It's right. very rare, but right. it's the contact. Right. And people don't think that concussions are an issue outside of football. You just hear people say, "Oh, it's only in football." Right. It's not only in football. No, no, and, and you know, gymnastics and absolutely and, and, and cheerleading uh, is also another big, big. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of injuries. Basketball, of, right, right. But I, I think that the the bigger issue is not so much the concussion hits okay the bigger issue are the hits that are not concussion hits that don't really get looked at as that was a bad hit they shrug it and off you could have a lot of those little hits okay and you get one little hit and then that kind of sets you off huh. right so i think that's really the power of what our tool does you know um my kids both play sports and i have them play right play, I, I just have them play once a month mm-hmm. and um and, and if i notice anything different then it prompts me to have a conversation Got right. It. So when COVID first started, uh, at the time my daughter was seven, um, and uh, one day I was the homeschool teacher, and uh, and uh, so I, every day I had him do. How'd that work out? Horrible, horrible. <laughs> I, I, I commend I commend all teachers. I know Amen. I could never ever do that job. Amen. I couldn't handle two kids, let alone twenty, <laughs> and they're my own kids, right? So, uh, but no. So one day. Every day I'd have them do something different. One day it was like art class. They had to draw pictures, and this guy showed you how to draw different stuff. But the one day I said, "Let's let's play Roberta today. Let's get a, let's get to do a checkup of ourselves." Okay. So my son played. All of his scores were green. My daughter played. Most were green. There were a couple of modules that were red, and they just happened to be the same modules that the guys in the NFL 
that were most likely going to qualify for the concussion settlement. Interesting. Did poorly and she did poorly. In. Okay. So I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Okay. So I said, okay, the next day I'm going to have you both play another session. So same thing. My son played. His scores were all green. My daughter played and um, she did exactly the same thing. All green and a few, few of the modules were red. So now I'm thinking she has a concussion. So I asked her, Vivian, did you, did you bang your head? And she said, no. I said, well, you're doing all your schoolwork. You're getting all the answers right I'm because I'm checking it. And so what's going on? Like, what is bothering you? Is there something bothering you? And she said, yeah, I miss my friends. Mm. So there was mm. nothing physical, physically wrong with okay. her. Okay. But she was starting to be depressed that she had to deal, <laughs> deal with me and her brother <laughs> all day instead of being able to engage with her friends. So Got it. I told my wife, and uh, she called some of the moms. They set up these Zoom play dates, which are now uh, a lot more common than they were yeah, you know, pre-COVID. For sure. for sure. But that really kind of helped her. And then when I checked the following week, she was back to normal. Wow. So little things like that. So you know, A little stressor then. Yeah. So when, when, when you talk about concussion hits, yes, you, you want to – you know, if I had if I had a kid playing football or if I had a kid playing any high contact sport like that, I would play, you know, as they get older, my kids are young, so there's no right. nothing crazy going on. But um, I would have them play it probably before the game and after the game. Yeah. Or if, you know, during, let's say you got summer uh, uh, f- football practice coming up, maybe have them play it before you start practice. Right. And have it play it once or twice a week during practice mm-hmm. to see are my scores green or did something change, right? So it's basically just creating a baseline before the activity. That's right. Okay. And then and then as you go through that activity, you can check it. Right? Interesting. And if something changes, Interesting. now you can take action. You know, okay. action might be take a day off from practice or d- don't do full contact or whatever the case may be. But at least you're able to see mm-hmm. with a little more precision the ebbs and ebbs and, and, and flows of, of your performance over time. So uh, what I'm I'm hearing is this, this is absolutely a preventative tool. Yes, that's absolutely. the essence of what you're that's doing right. is, to, right. is to catch, like um, almost similar to uh, you know a screening for a certain disease. You're well, basically it, it's like it's mindfulness. I mean, we're trying to make you, the individual, more aware of how do your actions impact your performance. Absolutely. Now you don't have to change them if you don't want, but if you know when you get two hours of sleep, you can't. <laughs> do certain things and when you get I eight can hours tell you that's like, true yeah well, but <laughs> some people they perform better with less sleep right? i know but, and i am not one of those but but it, it but no. the problem is we don't you know you if you go into your doctor for an annual checkup mm-hmm. when's the last time your doctor asked you how has your brain been since i saw you last year we don't ever think of it no. until something goes wrong but what organ in your body is more important than your brain right, right so right, right. it's a it's a preventative tool uh it takes a few minutes to do you know, playing it once a month is you know six minutes. You can afford six minutes a month, mm-hmm. um, and For that's sure. really. And, but if you want to play it every day, if you're going through, if you're trying to um, improve performance, or if you're trying to improve your sleep or reduce your stress, and you want to see if those things are having an immediate impact, you can play it every day if you want. You don't have to play it right. once a month. Right. Mm-hmm. How did you land here? Like, I mean, because I connected with you. I connected with you a couple of decades ago. I mean, yeah. I hate I'm saying that because a couple of decades ago should mean I'm back in my 20s. It really means I was in my 30s, late right. 30s. Right. Um, you, I had a conversation with you. Uh, we ran to each other. I think it was the, the mid 2000s. You were explaining to me your patent process. Right, right. We were just having a conversation. Right. But, right over my head and then, <laughs> then like a couple of years later I, there was streaming media and there was roku and things i'm thinking i think mark was explaining this was like five years ago right yeah yeah talk to me about what whenever tv wherever tv i was well there i even put you in the name talk to me like how that happened and, right, and, right. and wind it back a little bit to 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 what you went to school for sure because he's one of the few people that came out of Coriopolis and like did something really ultra high tech from our generation like yeah. i mean you like you like went out there in California and had a good time and I had a great time. Yeah, maybe, I'm sure you maybe, did. Maybe too, too too much of a good time. No, I, I um, yeah. So I mean, wherever TV. After living in LA for a long time, I uh, the company I work was work, working for there asked me to um, go to Shanghai for two years. Okay, and uh, and and we had a development center there, so we were developing software for other companies with developers in shanghai 
We had developers in L.A. We had uh, developers in India and Bangalore. Okay. Um, now, what year are we talking about, roughly? Two, well, I started there in 98, 99. Okay. And, um, and this was – I was asked to go over to Shanghai in end of 03. Okay. So I'd been there for a little over four years. Um, but when I went over there um, – this was like I said. This was in '04. We got there in January, and um, there was no uh, high speed internet. Uh, mm-hmm. Really, even here, there wasn't high speed internet. Right. And 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 over there was even you mean further. DSL wasn't high speed internet. Well, and that's kind of <laughs> so. So that's what what it was was DSL, right? So we had a DSL connection in our apartment in Shanghai, but DSL over there is a little bit than, different than DSL over here. Okay. So DSL over here. You could run your speed check and say, okay, hey, Comcast, I'm not getting my right. one megabyte per second or whatever it was back then, 800K. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you need to fix it, right? right? That's not how it worked in China. In China, they said you get DSL, but they would load it up with people. So you basically didn't even have a 56K yeah. connection. All the, yeah, right? I get it. So Bandwidth it, was full. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a tough situation. So, um, so I, I found myself in March. So I got there in January. In March, uh, AOL, I don't know if it was the first year they had done this. I think it might have been the first year that they were streaming the uh, March Madness on AOL. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, shit, I'm an AOL customer in the U.S. And there was no geo-blocking or any of that stuff back then. Okay. So okay. I said, I'm going to watch I'm going to watch March Madness. You thought you were going to. Well, I mean, I kind of did. <laughs> so, so I had I had my laptop, and again, there was no Wi-Fi back then either. Um, so I had my laptop connected with a Cat5 cable, and, and I had to run like a 40-foot cable from my one bedroom into the living room where my TV was, and the laptop was next to the TV. Then I had to get these RGB connectors from my, from my laptop into my... Um, into my tv right so then i would i'd have to get on the computer and get into aol then you get into aol and they go okay you're you're one you're number 100 on the waiting list so you'd have to wait for that to happen and then boom okay you're you're getting in you get in you hit play well then it would start buffering and it would you know wasn't streaming because you didn't have a dsl connection and then the computer would lock up so then i have to restart the computer And I said, man, this is a pain in the ass. Right, right. And so that's kind of what I would say that experience led me to think about all the things that we talked about whenever I saw you. So I started then thinking, okay, AOL's broadcasting um, March Madness live. And then uh, a few months later, Paul Tagliabu, who was the commissioner of the NFL at that time, was coming through with Chad, uh, what was his name, Chad Lewis, the tight end from the Eagles. I think it was Chad Lewis. So they were coming through and promoting American football in China. And uh, not not that there were any games or anything then, but they were just trying to build their brand over there. So I was part of the American Com- uh, Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. And so we got to go anytime one of these celebrities would come through. Sure. They'd have a breakfast, kind of a l- lunch, not a lunch and learn. It was a breakfast and learn. So you, you would go. They would tell you why they're there, what they're doing. And then you get to ask questions, right? So... Um, uh, Senator Feinstein came one time. Sir Richard Branson came another time. Well, the one time Paul Tagliabue came and, and I went and, uh, you know, there's only like 30 or 40 people in the room. So it's not this huge thing. It's pretty intimate. And so he gave his whole spiel about what's going on with the NFL and why they were in China. And so first question, you know, hey, I said, listen, I'm a Steelers fan. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm living here. I'd pay any amount of money to watch the Steeler games live. And he goes, well, you're in luck. Next year, we just did a deal with Yahoo, and we're going to start streaming games through Yahoo. So I said, wait a minute. So if the NFL is going to circumvent the cable companies Mm -hmm. and start broadcasting their content directly, Mm -hmm. uh, other people are going to do the same thing. This is before Netflix and all these other companies, right? right? right. So that's what really led me down the path to come up with the idea that I, I developed and then ended up building and patenting, which is, you know, taking a regular um, guide you have like you have with Comcast and inserting other people's content into that guide. Okay. So which now the probably the biggest one is Netflix. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so having mo- more than one, s- one source of content in a guide on your television was what I saw because I didn't want to have to get up and fumble with the computer and restart it to yeah, get that stream. Yeah. 
I just want to hit a couple yes. buttons and hit play, right? <laughs> right. And this is before iPhones and <clears throat> cell phones and mobile and all that stuff. That right. was that was kind of that was kind of uh, that came afterwards. So that's really kind of how I came up with the idea. Um, and then I started writing the patent. I remember uh, my, one of my wife's best friends got married down in, uh, in uh, a little island off of the coast of Bangkok. So we're down there and everybody's like, let's party. And I'm like, I'll be out in a few minutes. They're like, what are you doing, man? And I'm like, because you get these epiphanies. So I started writing down my thoughts and which you know, right eventually on. became my my patent. Right so, on. but yeah, but that was kind of the place that I came up with the idea. And I think I was able to do that because I wasn't, here and i didn't have anything right at my fingertips Got it. i was out i was outside the normal you know yeah, sw- comfort zone and uh and and you you know you kind of have to get creative and that's kind of why i think i got creative and was able to see that problem before most of the people saw it here you know domestically so, so wherever tell wherever okay. tv right right that was an interface to basically um it's like the big menu with all the input with all the different selections right, right. there and, and you th- your patent does explain a little exactly what that patent does so ba- basically what it lets you terms. do is it le- lets you manage both your cable subscription and non-cable subscriptions in one guide got it so you don't have to connect a computer to your tv to watch something over the internet it just goes right into your set-top box or right into your device or whatever's streaming to your television right okay so that's really kind of the 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 focal point of the of the patent is 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 that at least one source of content from a cable right an MSO cable company whatever you want to call it and one source of content from a non MSO like a Netflix okay and that was really the that's really what led me to patent that idea so at that moment that you that the patent was awarded <laughs> did you take that concept to market did was there was there devices was there how did that work <laughs> yeah no so that's a whole nother uh, can of worms so there was no roku devices there were no iphones um we ended up finding a device uh, uh there was a company in in chicago and they had a device that was not used to stream anything it was used to take your so you connect it to your computer and you connect it to your vhs player okay and it basically took your vhs tapes and it encoded them and then outputted the mp4 file which is the format for video right and so you were able to kind of do that without having to send it out for for, you know to a third-party service we were able because the way they developed that device is it was an open source device so unlike you know your iphone you can't change the software on your iphone right right but on an open source device we were able to remove their software completely and then we built our own set top guide software that got it was able to stream different signals from different places in different formats but output it onto the television okay so that was kind of done um initially i knew that we were not going to be and we were never trying to be a hardware company got it because you need to raise you know serious capital you need to raise at the time you probably needed to raise 70 80 million dollars now i'm sure it's a couple hundred million Mm -hmm. because there's always going to be something better that comes along um so my focus was always on the software software. side of thing so once once roku started to take off um i had a meeting with roku and i was like look i want to put this guide on your platform they're like we'd love to because they didn't have at that time they didn't have live live television like that it was all recorded stuff. Got and, it. You know, they really grew with Netflix. Yeah. So um, I, I had a meeting up in their offices up in the Bay Area, and I went in there, and uh, I said, okay. And we were supposed to be talking about finalizing our, our agreement. And the guy comes out and says, you need, you need to leave. And I'm like, what do you mean I need to leave? I just flew up here to meet with you guys. And they're like, well, we can't talk with you. I'm like, what do you mean you can't talk with me? Well, what had happened, which I didn't know, is Dish Network came in and signed an exclusive deal with them that basically banned any competitors from the platform. Wow. And they never told me that. They just basically wow. kicked me out of their office. Damn. Yeah, so that that, that kind of got the kibosh on that one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's basically kind of, um, you know, we eventually got onto Roku, but we couldn't, we couldn't do any U.S. channels. We had to do Indian channels. We had to do uh, Arabic channels. We had to do Greek channels. So there's a market for that though right there, there right. is but i mean the the holy grail is, are the american channels got right? it so we started to go out and, and acquire the rights to broadcast that but we couldn't do it on on roku mm. so at the time other platforms were coming out but you know and, and now you've got 
Um, you know, you've got other uh, smart platforms, although Roku is the biggest one. You know, Amazon now has Fire TV. Mm-hmm. Um, Apple has Apple TV, which really never took off. Um, but there are other uh, devices out there that you can you can get to. And now, you know, the, all these years later, uh, Xfinity has an app on Roku yeah. and Verizon. <laughs> so so now all the big boys were able to get on it. So what Dish did initially was try and stifle us, uh, you know, by signing that exclusive deal. And they did. I mean, that's basically what, what happened there. Power play. Yeah. Yep. You uh, spent that time in China. Did you like it? Uh, I loved it. My wife hated it. Um, it, it was. Plus, he's back in the states. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to be there now. I'll tell you that it's a different world now. We, yeah, were, for we were there sure. in 04 and 05. Uh, the present uh, day leader was not there. Different guy leading the country. Um, you didn't have all the technology. You know, I told you about the DSL connection, mm-hmm. but there were no video cameras and face recognition systems and social credit scores and all the things they're doing now to really. Uh, you know, keep a pretty tight control over the population. When I was there, it was like the Wild West. It was sure. like uh, New York City back at the turn of the 20th century. Well, they were finding capital, or they had just found capitalism in the late, late 90s, right? Right, right. Well, <laughs> and, 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 and not only that, but the city was really um, kind of advancing into, you know, in, in some ways ahead of us, right? They, they didn't have, people didn't have telephones in every house, so you had the older people everybody's got cell phones so their adoption of new technology they just leapfrogged over us right got it. in a lot of ways got it um airports infrastructure there were no roads so now they're building you know state-of-the-art roads high-speed rail um because they didn't have like you know we've had roads in pittsburgh you know for what 200 years and right some of them look like they haven't repaired in 200 years but pretty much but that that's the difference is you know these some of these countries that are just developing now are able to kind of leapfrog over us because they don't have that old infrastructure in there but being over there was it was it was it was uh it was crazy fast-paced life um never you were a dull in moment. shanghai oh we're right in downtown this, shanghai well there's so there's the old city which mm-hmm. is pushi and there's the new city which is pudong if you've seen uh i think it's mission impossible three where he's jumping off the building that mm-hmm. was like a block from where i lived got it so we lived in like the new futuristic looking part of the city Okay, that's modern Shanghai then. It is. It's Pudong is like the new part of the city, and it was, um, you know, it was it was just it was it was it was crazy. It was it was a good place to be at that time. Let's put it that way. Yeah, the uh, I, I think the average American really doesn't have a good grip on much about China in general, and I don't profess to. I didn't live there like you did. I did commission guitars from little guitar factories over right, there, right. which was unbelievable because they would go into the hills. And it, all throughout the country, practically, and they and the, uh, there'd be a guitar company there. They would rise up, and people would live there. Right, there'd be dormitories. Oh yeah, people were live like living there, yeah, yeah. and the quality. And this is before it, it affected me. Before the whole counterfeiting, we were these, this was legitimate business we were doing. We were announcing made in China, Washburn right. guitars, Boogie right. Street stuff, and I was absolutely blown away by the quality for right. the most part right right and you had plenty of factory it was like they're like where did all these the point is there's so many people right like there was factories popping up we could we had our we took one design you could shop into 30 factories right, right like right. where are who are these people right and um that that and same thing kind of on a smaller scale like in uh in south korea the same thing same right. kind of concept but in china what i noticed was this was the mid-2000s early 2000s and the communication was not quite there yet toward the end when i shut boogie street down the communication was instant like right. if i wanted to see a prototype the moment it came out of their shop we were getting photographs and video conferencing it, it literally almost happened overnight yes. and this is a very remote village yeah but they had everything we had well then like i said the, the the internet went up pretty quick over there and and um you know when i was there it was still kind of in the early days you know but uh but now, yeah, I mean, now they have every, everything in some cases, you know, better than what we have here. This Just the size, the sheer size of, like, I don't think we really have a good grip on what well, their population is absolutely enormous. Right. A billion people plus, like yeah. a billion yeah. two, they yeah, say. Shanghai's no. 26 million in Shanghai. Yeah. What is New York City now, do you know? I, I want to say it's maybe eight, nine. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Shanghai's 26. Yeah, and it's not the biggest city. Chongqing's like 30, I think 35 million. 
You know? Yeah, we just we just don't have yeah. a good grip on that, man. Yeah. We just don't. But I mean, you know, it's it it's 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 too much. I, I think it's too much. It's it's the cities are too too crowded. It's crazy. Yeah, but so in your time there, did it feel were people moving toward the city or moving out of the city? Oh no, no, people were all coming to the big cities to the city. That's where all the work and opportunities were. Yeah. Okay, because I didn't know that because we were seeing factories sprout up everywhere in, well, the, in, I mean, the, in the countryside. There, there, there definitely are people that are there. I'm not saying everybody's leaving, but you know, you you look at the growth of the big cities, and it, you know, you have um, a lot of the bigger manufacturing um, or let's say multinational companies are going to be in the bigger cities. They're not going to go to yeah. you know, the, the hills and the mountains. That's going to be yeah, you know, people more more domestic type uh, entrepreneurs. It was just I I couldn't believe it, and, and it, the, I couldn't believe the quality. Now I, right. again, right. that that got a lot of manufacturers in this country in trouble when there was a lot of duplication and counterfeiting right. and all that stuff. Right. But that really wasn't what was going on with in the early two thousands. Now the right. counterfeiting has become a huge issue in the guitar business, just like in the watch business and clothing right. and the rest right. of it. Right. But right. man, the quality I was like, wow, they're really starting to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. really figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Is uh, China the only um, foreign land you lived in? I, yeah, it's the only place I actually lived. Um, although, you know, when I when I um, uh, when we when we developed the software for Forever TV, I actually went over to Islamabad in Pakistan for a, a month, and I, so I didn't live there, but I was there for a month. And uh, in Pakistan, in Pakistan, in the two thousands, it was right after nine eleven. It was like oh my, know, it was like two thousand and uh, I think two thousand and. I think I don't know if my son was born or my wife was. I think it was like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, was there reservations in your mind before you went? Well, the the my partners were both. Um, there were two brothers that had a software company. Okay. And one of them had gone to Pitt, and I met him here in a business plan competition. He approached me and said, "Hey, if you need help building this, we can help you." Okay. And so um, they both, you know, spoke very very good English. Um, and then their other partner, uh, his father, t- turned out his father was pretty high up in the uh, Pakistani army. Okay. So the plan was whenever I flew in that his father's uh, secretary, this guy was supposed to meet me at the gate, which didn't happen. So, <laughs> of so, course it didn't. <laughs> so I get off the plane and I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm the oddball out here. I didn't fit in with everybody else in the way they looked and dressed and everything. And they knew where i was from and so it was a it was a i was kind of just checking it all out walking from the gate and i had to go through customs mm-hmm. i'm like man what am i do what do i do now because i didn't have a phone i had my phone but i couldn't call anybody right i wasn't on you know i didn't have a local sim card yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. 18, Sims, 18, that's 18 right. didn't work in pakistan at the time. so um as soon as I got through customs, the guy comes around, Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and then as soon as I got it with him and then we, we were able to get out of there and yeah. get into the van to head out, then I felt fine. And the people were there were, you know, fant- the people are fantastic. You know, you've got you've got bad people and you got good people mm-hmm. in any place you go. Right. Absolutely. So it's, it, I wasn't I wasn't like worried um, about my safety at all. Other than one, the first few minutes in town, uh, I wasn't worried about my safety. Now, the crazy thing is, is that um, I think right before I got there, uh, the one, I can't remember her name, if it was Benazir Bhutto, but somebody had gotten, one of their you know, big female leaders uh, got assassinated. Oh, great. <laughs> and, and that happened right before I got there. And then when I was there, there was a huge... Um, uh, and not in Islamabad. We went to another town, Lahore. And while we were in Lahore, uh, a military school got uh, hit by a suicide bomber. And I think 30 people got killed there. And mm. I was in the same town when that happened. Not, you know, it's a big city, so it's millions of people. But still, it's you're right there. You know, you're like, well, it's not somewhere halfway around the world. I'm, I'm here. No, you're seeing what you see on the news, actually. In <laughs> yeah. Real life. So, so those things happen. But like I said, the people, the the, the average person. Warm-hearted people. Food. Mm-hmm. The food was fantastic. I gained fifteen pounds over there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a good experience as well. I, I really enjoyed it. Not that I'm going to rush back anytime soon, but yeah, it was it was it was a good uh, it was a, it was a good experience. 
All right. So if I have the date right, in 2015, you were elected to the, your first term as a school board director in our hometown. And the ins and outs of doing that, you know, the specific things, not interested in that. I am interested in a thought process that, that, that you were going through or whatever kind of drugs you were on or right, alcohol right. binge you right, were on right. and made you decide to want to do that. The yeah. reason I say that is I did a little stint in the early yeah, 90s I, I, as I a do. much younger person. Right, right, right. And from 91 yeah. through like 96, yeah. a term and a half or whatever it was. And I was quite certain that I had gotten my fill and I, you know, I got through all that. So what was uh, <laughs> let, let me guess? Someone just came over one night and caught you at a weak moment and encouraged you to do it, and you just did it, right? Yeah, that's kind of that's, that's kind of how it happens, that's kind right? Of what, that's kind of what happened. Though. So uh, at the time, um, I, 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 was it 2015? Let's see, if it was 2015, my son would have been in first or second grade. Yeah, I, I think that sounds about right because I'm in my middle of my second term right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, there there were a group of us uh, at one of our friends' houses uh, for some celebration. I don't know what a summer party or whatever. And that one guy um, said, I, "I'm trying to get, find you know five people to run for school board. Uh, I, I really want to push a merger with Moon." And I'm like, "Okay," I said, <laughs> "Good luck," you know. And, he, <laughs> and he's like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Well, y- you should probably learn the history of." Uh-huh. the moon cornell discussions and mergers and right kind of how that all works and right. i said they tried it you know right after i graduated and then they tried it again 10 years later and and it got close but it, it just wasn't meant to happen mm-hmm. and i think i said the problem you have is twofold which is number one um i don't think anybody in moon's rushing to merge with us and i think there's a pretty good sized population here that also doesn't want things to change mm-hmm. and so i don't know why i said yeah i do it but i maybe a beer or two later but yeah <laughs> so i agreed and the crazy thing is, is that he didn't win and, and i did and then he shortly thereafter moved to moon and his kids are in, 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 okay. in school now okay so yeah that's kind of how it happened and uh you know if i commit to something i don't want to do it and I, my father-in-law told me this one he said if you're going to do something you know do it right Mm -hmm. and and i and i kind of said okay you know i i uh we didn't have all five of us didn't win i think you know three of us won (laughs) so and we went into a pretty hostile um environment so you didn't win majority then for whatever that for whatever that means we did not have the majority yeah whatever that means right and and i still don't have any majority (laughs) so but no i think that um initially uh because now my son's going into ninth grade and my daughter's one of the fifth. Right. And, um, you know, even if a merger went through, there, neither of them would, would benefit from that. So I've kind of got off that. I kind of got off that. At mm-hmm. the beginning, uh, a lot of people were very upset uh, that that's what I wanted to do. And it's not because I don't love our town. I don't love our school. I don't think the people up there, I think they're our staff, the teachers are fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they go above and beyond what, what most teachers I've seen have done. Right. So I don't think it's any of that. I, I, I was just looking at the opportunities. And, you know, I know whenever I was in school, I ended up my senior year, I had two study halls. I really stopped. I didn't really have a math class. Um, computer science was watch go telling me and eric bull and billy bittner go build a program (laughs) and that was kind of our computer science class Uh, you know what i mean so uh, i get it i i really wanted my son to have more opportunities than 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 i did and and i got a lot of pushback from some of the other board members who called me out and said you know i'd never take my kids out of this school and um there there are plenty of opportunities at cornell and i said i never said there were none right but you know you look at our 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 class uh our classes we've got like three ap classes up there you go to moon or you go to quaker valley you're looking Mm -hmm. at mid-20s certainly so that's really all that it was and you know i get the whole small school um thing and that and i think that's kind of why my position was i'm not going to fight this i'm one guy Mm -hmm. but I can try and talk sense into people, but at the end of the day, if you don't want to change, right? You know, it's kind of like 
going back to the Roberto app, that's about behavior modification. Right. If you don't want to improve your sleep or reduce your stress, yeah. then I wouldn't expect your performance to change, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what I saw there. So it was at the beginning, it was the intent was let's go and try and get this merger through. If we can get, you know, five of us on the board, we still would have to go find interest from the other side, but at least we'd have our side tied up. Right. And, um, and then when the next election came, I wasn't even going to run. And, and, you know, basically the, some of the people on the board said, please just run one more term. So I did a write into the second term and ended up winning that as well. Right. And, you know, what I've tried to focus on while I've been on that board, um, initially it was getting every kid in the school a device. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're in the internet age. This is pre COVID. And, you know, the, there was some concern about what if they break them? What if they lose them? What if they damage them? And I'm like, well, we can get insurance. I mean, that, that'll solve that problem. Yeah. And we were able to just through the grants and some of the things that the, the funds that are available to Cornell. I mean, I look at my kids' school, which is a Catholic school, and I look at Cornell and the amount of money that goes in for technology and some of the other things is tremendous up there. So sure. there are definitely, you know, so what I what I tried to do then was say, okay, how can we use some of these things to our advantage, you know? And so really that was kind of step one was trying to get that to happen. And and, and we were able to. So um, Dr. Thomas and, and some of the other pe- people up there saw that and saw that as, you know, it would be a good idea. And so fortunately, by the time COVID hit, everybody had devices. Yeah. So we were able to do that hybrid learning, Got it. virtual learning, because they had the device. And the other challenge became with um, connectivity. So Comcast has a program for like $9 a month for low-income families mm-hmm. to get to get uh, internet. Well, mm-hmm. there were some families that still didn't do that. Not, not a ton of them, but still, sure. every kid we want to have connect- Absolutely. connectivity. At that time, this group approached, um, I don't know if it was Dr. Hopp or Dr. Thomas up at the school, and said, hey, we have this meta mesh network where we can beam internet down to Coriopolis and wirelessly. And wirelessly, and then you can offer to those people for free. Okay. All they have to do is put this little device on the outside of their house, and then they're able to connect into our network. So this thing's being broadcast from the Cathedral of Learning wow. to the water tower. Got it. And then from the water tower, it's being broadcast to all, all the residents. And, and anybody can get the free internet. It's not just uh, right, right, right. Not just kids at school. So if there's other you know older folks that want right. internet, they they can sign up through that Meta Mesh network. So that was the second thing. The third thing that I really wanted to focus on was using data up at the school better than they were. Right, and and it's just about self improvement. So um, in the past, like were, what do you mean? So. In the past, there were uh, several times a year there were assessments, mm-hmm. right? So, okay, you know, Johnny's behind in this subject, or he's not. He's he's red, right? Kind of like the same thing with our app: red, sure. yellow, and and and, and uh, green. So, my point was, if we're able, if you get, if you get through lesson plan one, and Johnny's behind, why would we go to lesson plan two? Mm-hmm. Because now, if he doesn't grasp the first concept, right? He's definitely not going to yeah. get the next one. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. when you get to three, four, five, all he's doing is... Yeah, he's getting left behind. Right. So there's been a shift up there as well to really do that more more rapid intervention. Okay. And, and this year, uh, we did it with uh, kindergarten, first and second grade. And I think next year, it's going to be third and fourth grade as well. And, and that's really important because if you get to third grade and you're behind, if you're not on level, your chances of catching up you know get slimmer they lose that kid by third grade yeah yeah Yeah. so that's really kind of you know what i've tried to work with them on is just and 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 you know not everybody wants to do it Mm -hmm. you have some people that are are resistant to it but i think politics well that's just life and anything absolutely not everybody wants to change but the intent uh of of doing it isn't to burden the teachers or burden anybody else it's to identify those kids that are behind and get them help faster than every nine weeks Mm -hmm. trying to get it every week Mm-hmm. So that's really kind of what we've been working on now up at Cornell uh, to try and, you know, catch the people that are behind as, as soon as we can. What was the pandemic like? Uh, I want to talk about you, you professionally, personally, but also talk about as a school board director. Let's do that first. Like the pandemic hits 
so we go in lockdown. Um, I, I had my youngest, uh, Gwen, was at Moon High School, so right. I saw how that was roughly handled with her. <laughs> she was already out of school. My other, uh, my son was already out of school by then. That so was a, that was a circus up there. Yeah, it was. There was some. There was some. There was some interesting <laughs> acrobatics going on at Moon Moon High School. No very, doubt. Very different. We have very different boards. Uh, yeah, for sure. We're nowhere near as political, um, you know, as they are up there. And I think that yeah. there are pros and cons to that, but. Well, They've had an interesting rough uh, yeah. decade, yeah. I would say, of, yeah. of politics up there. Well, all kinds of stuff, yeah. But uh, no, I think you know we. Um, I think we were very practical uh, and used common sense. You know, as an example, um, when we had to go back for the following year, the question was, do we do um, do we do virtual? Yeah. Do we do hybrid, where we have half the kids come in? in the morning and the other half stay at home and do virtual just to keep them away from each other is that well social social distancing you had to keep like i don't know if it was six feet nine feet but in any case we didn't have the space okay to 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 have everybody there at 100 percent capacity right and have so enough space between everybody okay because at that time there was you know certain yeah for sure for sure certain distance right so um the question is what do we do and i said well why don't we just ask the parents (laughs) I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't have any kids here, and I don't mm-hmm. think anybody else. Right. At the time, there might have been one school board member that had kids in school, but none of us have kids here. Let's see what they want to do. Sure. And, and they overwhelmingly, the first year, wanted to do hybrid. So okay. So hybrid was okay. half day in class, half day at home, the whole year, you know, and uh, it worked out really well. Um, when I say really well, it worked out really well from a functional standpoint. I think that the young kids... Uh, the kids that were kindergartners when COVID hit, that were in first grade then, that were in second grade this year, I think that class has really suffered the most, not just at Cornell, I think nationwide. Mm-hmm. And because a lot of learning early on is reading lips, and everything was all of you know covered. The, everything was covered for these kids, you know, first and second grade. So it really set a lot of them back. Now the kindergartners and the first graders actually have 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 done done better. So okay. We'll see what happens. So they didn't really lose because the fear was everybody was going to lose a year across the board. You know, do you think well, that actually happened? I think that some kids, you know, I think what it allowed uh, to happen is you have less supervision because the kids aren't there one hundred percent of the time. But having that hybrid worked out where you at least had a touch point every day. But at the end of the day, you can't make a kid do his homework, and if the parents aren't in- engaged what are you going to do right so there are some kids i think that knew that and probably skated through because they knew they didn't have to but i think the majority you know i I don't i don't have access to all the grades or anything like that so i don't really know but i i just i just think that um the parents that were involved their kids i won't say are fine but i think they're probably better than the the kids whose parents aren't aren't involved yeah I, i mean my wife was um she was um, watching a young young one because the mother had to go back to work, so she was helping out. And so Natalie had to go back and you know be the parent, mom, <laughs> teacher, mom, whatever that was. And oh, that yeah. was just watching that from afar. Believe me, I watched it from afar. <laughs> I'd walk in the kitchen and I'd see what was going on with his iPad and you know the short attention spans and all that stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm thank God my kids are grown. <laughs> no, I was in the middle of this. So my my uh, my daughter was in what second grade. My son was in fourth. And I was teaching them all and everything, you know, for, for wow. a couple of months. And then they finally got, you know, the, 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 the nice thing is the following year, mm-hmm. they were back full time uh, the following year. So they, right. they didn't, they weren't out of school, you know, other than the first couple of months. Yeah. 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 The, if you had to uh, sit and reflect on, you know, so it's like you're seven years into this political thing. Seven years. God bless you, man. Yeah, Fifteen, yeah, right? Yeah. Twenty says. What, what are, give me some takeaways from there. I mean, what, what's what's what has surprised you? If you had to reflect on it, because you're seven years in now, if you look back, what's different than what you thought it would be? Um, you know, I I think that initially, whenever I was putting my kids first, um, my focus was trying to see how we can get a merger going. Okay. And I think what ended up happening is once we made the decision to to move them to Catholic school, that focus 
shifted to not to say I didn't want to help before, but really that's all that I focused. It was, I don't really think about the merger or merger right. talks really at all. Right. Um, not that I'm not open to them. I just, it's not a priority to me. And I okay. think the priority to me now, like I said it earlier, was getting everybody that device, mm -hmm. getting everybody connectivity, and then trying to use data to keep. And the other thing that we did, we started a summer, and it's nice to see that it's growing. So, you know, I came up with an idea to start a summer reading program at the Coriopolis Library, mm -hmm. trying to get these kids uh, engaged. There's a new place called The Hub down yes. on 4th Avenue, and yes. Lucinda's doing a great job there. And I think, you know, trying to incorporate those local assets and resources into not necessarily do what the school's supposed to do, but to give these kids a place because a lot of a lot of a lot of parents aren't going to get them up to the school. That's a haul to get up there, right? Sure. Whereas sure. walking to the hub or the library is something you can do on your bike or, mm -hmm. or just walk, right? So I think that that that's become my focus is trying to find ways to really um, you know get these keep these kids on level and 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 and, and you know try and give them as best an opportunity to succeed after school as possible do you think that um at the core of it the kid wants to learn do you believe that like that most children have this comp compunction to learn it's just sometimes we we just don't we don't meet we don't meet them halfway yeah i mean i think <laughs> I, I think it's two things right i think um there are kids that want to learn and there are kids that want to be lazy um there are parents that w that want their kids to learn and their parents that don't give a shit. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the challenge is it, no matter what we do or what, what is implemented at that school, once they leave and go home, it's really out of the hands of, 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 of the school at that point. Sure. Right. And I think that's a big determinant of what happens with that child is how much, uh, structure and how much, um, and not just for schoolwork, but anything uh, that their parents or the parent or the grandparent, whoever's raising that child uh, does. You know, I think that that's going to be a bigger indicator of, uh, of of success than than most people really think about. So it's just a matter of uh, parental involvement or, or lack thereof. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big one. I mean, there's there's some stories. Um, you know of, of things that are happening that, that are heartbreaking yeah uh, for sure just home home situations you know and um well the pandemic probably exacerbated a lot of already yeah, tough situations yeah. i would think yeah it did i it would did. think well i mean you think about it you know you have some kids that the only place they're getting food not the only food but the majority of their food was at school mm -hmm. you know they're getting uh breakfast they're getting lunch and in some cases they're getting dinner up there and so well things have changed mark <laughs> yeah, and 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 with with, wow. with with COVID, I mean, it, there's a program now at Cornell where it's free, so yeah. nobody has to pay, no matter what your parents earn. Right, everybody's getting free food, and and the program is based on uh, how many people actually use it. So they want people to, to get the free food because if they don't get it, then they it gets taken away. Right, so that's that that was a big eye opener. So you know, as part of what happened there. <clears throat> with some of the work that my wife does, uh, she got together with um, with with uh, one of the uh, administrators up there, uh, Mrs. Antoniadis, and they created this snack pack program, and it's extended up to Mooncrest as well. So, what they do is is they give uh, kids uh, a bag every Friday of mm -hmm. of like grab and go type food, mm -hmm. and this was really specifically was meant initially um, during the summer. Because they're not at school five days a right, week, right? Right, right, right. And so they're doing it a couple times a week. But during the school year, what they found out was when these kids need stuff Saturday and Sunday as well. So initially, that program was like I think thirty or forty kids. Now it's almost two hundred, and that's like I said, that's Cornell and and Mooncrest. So trying to make sure these kids have food to eat, so that you know, if you don't have any food, that's fuel. Mm -hmm. and if you don't have any fuel, your car's not going to run. Absolutely you know? so not. Really, just trying to keep keep everybody healthy and. And you know, in in the best possible place they can be. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about the pandemic? And as we sit here in twenty twenty two, your gut tell you, are we past it? Do you think that we there's still going to be pockets of it? Do you think something else is on the way? What do you? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, but I, no, mean, I, I I don't know. I I just you know my thought 
my initial thought was, you know, we lost a lot of people here. Um, and mm-hmm. so I'm not saying we haven't, but when you start looking at history and you look at some of the things that have been before us, this was pretty minor mm-hmm. in terms of, 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 of clearing out people, right? Mm-hmm. So my first thought was, man, what, what if the next one is, is a lot more deadly than this one? Mm-hmm. Not, not so much, is there going to be one or not going to be one? I mean, you know, there's a lot of research being done. <clears throat> I think by a lot of countries, uh, including ours, and I think that that's, yeah, I don't know if that necessarily led to this, but we're kind of playing with fire in, in a lot of ways. So, yeah. who knows? You know, who knows? Um, I mean, did you did you do any personal study of like the the last pandemic, which is about a hundred years ago, right, right, right? And how right. that unfolded, and this kind of somewhat unfolded the same way. But we probably weren't killing each other back then. You know what I mean? Like we weren't attacking each other on social no, media I, platforms, I, I, right? I can't tell you that I did any any research on, on the last one. No, I just was kind of looking at this one and yeah. looking at um, the actual. And there was a paper that was published really early on. Um, and then it got removed uh, from, from or whoever. I think it was a Chinese scientist okay. who was at Wuhan. And, and, and they were talking about... Um, the 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 protein that i guess is the one that penetrates the human cell in this virus <clears throat> is like almost 100 percent effective whereas a traditional uh bat virus or whatever virus you know would have been a lot less so that to me again the scientist in me not that i'm a mm-hmm. uh, i'm a virologist or anything but it's saying that something seems odd there seems engineered but like why well you could say that but I, i'm just saying i won't go to that level but why was it so much more contagious? Right, viral. Yeah. Why was it? Why was that one aspect of it? And there's other research that was being done that just so happened to be that type of research. So, again, I'm not yeah. trying to say I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist, but you start you start adding up these uh, coincidences and mm-hmm. say, wait, how many coincidences? Is well, enough? I think that's what. Okay, so I think that's what a lot of the average folk, me definitely included. Uh, you know, we're, we're out there looking and trying to make rational decisions about what's coming at us. I think it's easy to sit back and say, well, if I take a deep breath and I look at everything collectively, things just look <laughs> look a little odd. You know, well, I mean, you can say that about everything. Maybe I mean, we, maybe we right all, now maybe like, we all we could have said that. We're though. like, the, well, the whole world is like it's a bizarre world right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> every, everything. It's just it's it's crazy. So is it okay? Is it really that? Or is it there's just so much media and in inputs constantly being thrown at us? Is it that? Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think that. Um, yeah, I think social media has a, a part to play in it. I think um, your 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 big. Me- I mean, if you look at media over our lifetime, there's been a huge amount of consolidation. You don't say. <clears throat> Only a few people mm-hmm. control most of the voices mm-hmm. that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so with with the limited competition, you know, it's easier to kind of keep the message. Wasn't cable like the invention of cable news and the cable in general supposed to increase competition? Like in the Ooh, late seventies, right, right, right. early eighties. Well, if you remember right? CNN when it first started, I mean, yeah. it was a great channel, you uh-huh. know, and and, and yeah. all of them. I'm not just saying CNN, you know, Fox and and MSNBC, and they're all uh, everybody's got an agenda. No, and, certainly, and and. Nobody's reporting the news. It's always reported from whatever message they want you to to believe, and that's the problem. Is I, no try, I, I try not to yeah. watch that. You know, it's just. But where do you go? Like, if you really, you know, you know we'll go to the BBC. <clears throat> oh, the BBC. You know, it's got a, it's got a certain bent to if you pay attention. So, really, to get something purely independent, because I would make the argument, I'd make the argument that, um. Network news always had, if you, you know, nothing was ever down the middle. There always was a liberal slant. Right, you had right, to look for it, right. and it was disguised often, but it wasn't so outwardly, um, you know, specific as it is today. There, you know, I, I don't know. That's that's just how I remember news. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's, I think it's it's both sides. I, you know, to me, it's more about trying to keep us i think 
the the idea now is to keep us at each other's throats. They polarized. Yeah, that's. I think that's that's what that's what all this stuff's about now. It's more about keeping us fighting with each other rather than mm-hmm. paying attention to really what's going on. Yeah, in and the solving world. and solving problems. Yeah, and dealing yeah, in the middle yeah. is, is and, not and sexy. That's right. And it's and but I think that I think that um, I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens here in a couple of months. But I think that. Uh, I think there's going to be a swing back more to this. I'm hoping there's a swing back more to the center. I don't vote party line. Right. I know I'm going to vote for right. who I think is the best person for the job and mm-hmm. the primaries. I vote for both parties and the, you know, pretty much every election. I don't, I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I voted straight party line. Yeah. And I don't really don't even look at the initial yeah, after the letter anymore. I don't think that, that that matters either. Yeah. You, know, you have a lot of people that are, kind of all working together from both sides and so yeah it's 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 unfortunate but um it's just the way it is you know it's the way it is now but yeah it's a, we want to belong to a team it's sexy to belong to a team you right. know and, and it's and i when i got into the guitar business mark i realized one thing i can make a lot of money in this business if i create custom things because right. americans i can only speak about americans at the time Americans love their own unique thing. Like right. if they get something that their neighbor doesn't have, they want to show it off. We're, right. we're a very outwardly showy society. Right. We'd like the uniqueness. I did well with that concept. But now I think we still have a lot of that. But we're so quick to join a team and like give our independent in terms of our cognitive ability, give our independence away. I we're so quick to do that. I don't know what changed. Like I mean I mean I I, I don't like- get it. I, I just think that um, if you look at, is it easier? Well, I mean, I just look at the, and I don't know when this happened, but the ability to just have a debate with somebody, mm-hmm. and not just in in Congress, but I mean anywhere, just with friends. Right. And, and now people get so emotional. I think they let the emotions take over from trying to have a dialogue and and listening. You know, I've I've been told I'm a horrible listener. Um, I I don't think I'm as bad as as other people think I am. Mm-hmm. I know it could be better, absolutely, but I think that that's something that we um, we have we've kind of lost sight of is listening and really trying to respond with logic. And, mm-hmm. and now it's more responding with emotion, mm-hmm. you know, or these one liners or the memes. I mean, there's there's just a whole new uh, way of of dealing like i can't tell you every day you know i i get on facebook not to post stuff but just to scroll and see what other people are posting mm-hmm. and it's like the same shit every day you know it's like man i i don't talk politics on facebook it's just you're not going to so, change anybody. you're not going to change anybody else's mind i used wait. to and you know i lost some friends over that sure. and i just said this isn't worth it no. it's really not In the worth end, it it's not worth it no it's not and it's you know, my friends are my friends, and and uh, you know, if, if if you feel that w- we've drifted apart, and you don't want to talk about how can we drift back together, but you just want to start name calling, I really don't know what to do at that point. You know, yeah. it's like it, you're probably better off, you know, getting rid of the negative energy mm-hmm. in your life. So that's, mm-hmm. I think, where I am now is just trying to spend as much time with my family as I can, and and uh, and and just be positive and try and make positive things happen right we grew up in an era i believe that politics had a very minor role in our day and day out life meaning that we had a limited amount of news that our parents were probably ingesting when we were younger what did i know about politics uh i knew my friends had the devitos were a good family so <laughs> one, so one, once every two years or once maybe once right. every two years someone would walk around with a button on right, and right. you know and yeah. they'd ask for your vote and usually they'd bother you while you're eating a bowl of cereal and you go to the door and deal with it and hey how you doing and that was that was the extent of the right. influence of politics in my day in day out life right. and then with the increased media and i don't mean even mean social media before them with 24-hour news right, and right. when when how do i say this i'm gonna love to get your thoughts on this when news became opinion pieces as the norm like everything became a big editorial as opposed to just factual like matter of fact kind of reporting then all of a sudden it became like almost like a reality television it started to blend together like you know it was entertainment like news became entertainment and i I go back to 
I'll go back to Bill O'Reilly with Inside Edition in the late 80s. You know, then Dateline NBC started. All these shows were taking reality, sexying up the story. And then from just, just from a, it turned in from a story you told about something that happened a year ago. Mm-hmm. Now they're just reporting on what's happening like 20 minutes ago. But it's all in a story format and it's easy for the brain to consume. Like it's like, I think it's, we just all fell right into it and got steered one way or another based on our sensibilities. And now we're just, we're, we're fighting with each other. It's nuts. Well, that, that, I mean, and I think that's all, that's the intent. I think mm-hmm. the intent is to have us fighting with each other. Uh, and not listening to each other and not trying to 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 really help one another but uh you know i i, I don't know when all that started i maybe just 60 know. minutes in the 70s you want to go back <laughs> when, when 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 news started to be entertainment right 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 right, right. the magazine show yeah do we need that right 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 <laughs> well you also if you look at like the even the local evening news you, every story is, is, is not everyone but probably 90 percent of them are negative you know, mm-hmm. this person got shot or there was an accident here or this bridge collapsed or it's not, a, I'm not saying it should be all positive, but put a little more positive. Something so, you, in there. so what happens is you have that happening. I think you have a lot more people today taking, um, you know, prescription drugs versus whenever ah, we were kids. Good point. And I think that probably has a, a lot to do with it. I think that um, just. You mean the antidepressants and things? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you've got, you know, just people are diagnosed with things that that we didn't know, know existed in the 70s well, or, or, or we just said oh that's it's normal right so i think there's there's that yeah. little shift i think that yeah. um i think you know i mean not trying to be uh, uh religious or moral i think the whole family structure and some people would balk oh the, you know you don't need to have a man in a, in a in a family well you don't need to but i think two parents if they're even two the same uh, mm-hmm. Sex doesn't matter, mm-hmm. but having that structure and that guidance for the kid, and I think that oh, I think that's undeniable. Yeah, and I think that that's an, another thing that's changed. Um, so there's a lot of things that have happened, but yeah, I think that the whole uh, the whole change in the media is is I can't explain why it happened or when it happened or how it happened. We just know it happened, mm-hmm. and uh, it's not for the better. <laughs> no, no. And, and I again, um, I, it's a tough road to go down to. I don't typically like to talk about morality because it's so subjective. But, right, right, right. But, you know, some people say when the Ten Commandments were being pulled off of municipal buildings, you know, that that, that was bad. Well, you set the religious angle aside. There's there's a ten generally pretty good ideas to live your life by to keep civil order. Right. right. <laughs> that being that there's a there's some kind of um, there's some kind of uh, movement to question every moral tenant the country is under. Like we're, right, we're questioning, right. like, is that really bad or good? Maybe some of that questioning is okay, but the culture to me, Mark, it just seems sick. Like the American culture is ill. And the, and the reason I, I believe it's because w- violence is, is is what it is and it continues to grow because we just don't value each other. Well, I mean, and I, my, from my I, limited yeah, viewpoint. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I look at, at you know, uh, my son loves playing the video games and it's, that's pretty, I mean, I allow him, my, my wife and I allow him to, but, uh, um, but we try and have conversations with him as well, you know, and I think mm-hmm. that. Uh, I think that 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 also that whole growth of the video game industry and the violence there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we when we were kids, you had a problem with somebody. Mm-hmm. You went outside after school and you, you punched each other a couple of times, and that was the end of it, right? Right. Now, you know, you look somebody cross-eyed, they pull out a gun and shoot you. You mm-hmm. know, so I think that um, again, extremes. I don't think it's because there's more guns. I think it's because people don't value other people's lives. I think that's the mm-hmm. problem. You know. So I, I I don't know I don't have the answers to any of this stuff but no we're not going to solve everything tonight <laughs> man but, but dude I really appreciate you doing this yeah no worries just as like long overdue and, and if if you haven't gathered by now that Mark and I were in school together I probably haven't had this much of a substance a substantive conversation with him really this long if we didn't have a couple beers in front of us maybe 30 <laughs> years ago sitting on someone someone's porch hiding from our parents that's maybe it, but that's it no but i do appreciate it dude any kind of dialogue um and uh, just having you still in my life is important to me it gives me a little connection likewise, back, back to back to what we where we came from and and uh, our roots man yeah and and another reaffirmation that small towns are good for this country 
Well, you know? so much so that I came back and I, you know, I so came back, we. <laughs> I came back cause my mom was ill, but, um, we ended up staying here and, uh, you know, my wife initially was kind of caught off guard cause she had lived in big cities prior to coming here and it, 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 she was down in the cash market and I was still in China and I don't know who came up to her and said, which Kavik are you married to Mark or Joel? And she's like, who are you? How do you know my husband's name? How do you know my name? How do you know married? Like all these questions that she just was like, what? Like what? And now welcome to Coriopolis. Well, and now, 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 now I call her Nubby Debbie because she knows everybody and she loves it. She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to leave. So. Yeah. Right on, man. Yeah, but again, I appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, no, no worries. All right, we'll do this again. Thank you. Thank All you. All right, you got it. Mark Kavik, your friends, we're out. <laughs>